Everyone, you ready for your minds to be defiled? Um, my name is Mike Thompson. I'm a writer and editor here in New York, and I will be your moderator for Fiction, Fantasy, and Faith. Um, as you can read from the program, we're going to be looking at all the different ways that mysticism, magic, faith, superstition, divinity, all these sorts of things um, stay with us and sort of transmogrify as we keep hurtling forward into our technologized future present. Um, we have an amazing group of panelists with us, too. Let me introduce you to them. Um, first is Stephanie Monahan. You want to raise wave to your audience there. Stephanie is a writer, illustrator, and youth culture researcher for MTV. Her work focuses on horror films, haunting, and cultural memory. She's part of the film collective behind Spectacle Theater in Brooklyn, which you should um, definitely go to if you haven't already. It's a great space. Uh, next is Dave Evans. I want to say hi to everyone, Dave. Dave is an artist and researcher based in Liverpool. Uh, he makes wireless local area networks as art and writes about contemporary self-denial, um, which is a good metaphor for our PowerPoint issues so far. Um, he's also a PhD candidate in visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, next is Julian Hanna. Uh, Julian was born in Vancouver and is currently an assistant professor at Madeira Interactive Technologies Institute in Portugal. He, his writing on literature and technology often appears in academic journals. His creative essays can be found in The Atlantic, Berfois, Minor Literatures, 3AM, and elsewhere. Uh, he co-authors a critical futures blog called Crap Futures with designer James Auger. And finally, uh, Ashley Darcy is a poet, uh, head of the creative and editorial at Poncho, and a contributing editor at Newest York. Um, so with that out of the way, I will get out of your way and uh, leave the stage to Stephanie. Hi, uh, I'm excited to be back at Theorizing the Web. Uh, my name is Stephanie, and my presentation is called Don't Go Over There, Adolescent Legend Tripping Goes Online. So to start, I wanted to share uh, this photo that I took about two summers ago when I was visiting a friend in Athens, Ohio. Are there any people from Ohio in the room? Oh my, okay. So you know that Ohio is like a, like a lovely haunted place, like very, very fun and haunted. Um, so this is the Moonville Tunnel in Vinton County in the southeastern part of Ohio. And it's an abandoned railroad tunnel that used to house an active line until about 1985. So the tracks aren't even there anymore. And most of the town of Moonville isn't there anymore either. It's a former mining community, which is never very large to begin with. But the coal industry in Ohio has been on decline for decades, and all that really remains in Moonville are a few foundational structures, a cemetery, and this tunnel, which is very haunted. So there's a few uh, really good ghost stories associated with it, and it makes sense because enough people did actually die from being hit by a train when walking through the tunnel. It's kind of deceptively uh, long and takes a long time to walk through it so people would get stuck in there with the train. Um, so what you do is uh, young people will go there and build a fire as the sun is setting and roast some hot dogs and have some beers. And uh, by the time it's totally dark and only your fire is lit, you should be able to see the, the light of a rail railroad inspector's lamp deep in the tunnel as he attempts to find his way to the other side. So I want to share this not only because I think the photo is cool, which I think is very cool, and uh, the tunnel is cool, which I do, but um, I think this is a good example of what one would consider traditional legend tripping. So uh, legend tripping is, um, if you don't know what it is, it's a term used by lots of uh, anthrop anthropologists and folklorists to describe the practice of venturing to a site where a horrific event or haunting has taken place. And it's usually to denote an adolescent rite of passage in terms of how it functions socially, but I don't think it needs to just be adolescence. Uh, but something it does require in order to make it legend tripping is some form of performative participation, usually in the form of sharing a story or a legend associated with the place on the way to get people in the headspace for a scary time. Sometimes it's leaving material items at the site, and it, it can often be a form of delinquent behavior like graffiti or just hanging out and drinking beer. Another important characteristic to keep in mind is that legend tripping is not tourism. It's defined... Um, it's defined by another delinquent activity, which is illegally trespassing. So ultimately, it's something that you do alone with a few friends and do not pay money to see, which differentiates it from ghost tours or 
dark tourism or Thano tourism, which is visiting like war memorials, sites of death camps, et cetera, even if some of the aspects are overlapping in theme. So in response to critiques of vandalism, especially during the satanic panic in the 1980s, folklore has argued for positive aspects of legend tripping, mostly regarding how the practice is a way for youth to experiment with testing boundaries in a mostly safe way, engaging in storytelling and folklore in the same way that we've done forever. So I, however, will go further and claim that legend tripping's potential value comes from how the practice becomes a way in which many youth encounter alternative histories, cultural memory, and the porous boundary between physical space and ideology. For even a limited moment in time, legend tripping forces the people doing it into a confrontation with their own understanding of their local geography and history. A story can be mostly fake or fake lore and still reveal a ton about anxieties or troubled history of a community. The subaltern stories and voices that hegemonic powers want forgotten, so they are thus forced to reveal themselves only in folklore. And with this in mind, it's no surprise that legend tripping is considered a very American practice. So the more dreamy occultish nature of the feeling and mindset that participants are likely to tap into while legend tripping creates a sense of the enduring ephemeral, ephemeral, that there is a rupture in time and that history is both in the past and constantly on your heels and that we are constantly haunted. It's only brought to our attention when we put in work to conjure it. So I wanted to bring up this, uh, this quote by Mark Fisher. Um, some of you probably know his work. He's done a lot about hauntology and the weird and the eerie. And he said that haunting can be seen as intrinsically resistant to the contraction and homogenization of time and space. It happens when a place is stained by time or when a particular place becomes the site for an encounter with broken time. He was talking about the film The Shining, but I think it applies here. And uh, the tripping aspect of legend tripping comes from the effective impact the experience has on participants. Experiencing a legend through performance is the power to charge a place with meaning, and it becomes a space in a more phenomenological sense. Um, one that connects you to history and others who have come into contact with it before you. In other words, legend tripping creates incorporeal social networks. By participating in legend tripping, one engages in an open source-esque community project where parts of a legend were constructed by community members, approved or edited by other community members, each with its own tradition and influence. And the content lives or dies depending on whether or not community members continue to share it. It is in this way that although legend tripping was previously conceptualized as a practice firmly rooted in geographic place, it found not only a home online, but an opportunity to be pushed further to more radical places for good and for bad. So in fact, it's safe to say that legend tripping in one form or another has always been tied to modern technology. Uh, Michael Kinsella, a folklore scholar, noted that the force that legend tripping has in people was reminiscent of that of the early 20th century spiritualists who attempted to convince people at their events and parties of the existence of spirits by capturing evidence of them, usually in the form of parlor tricks, but they utilize and manipulate emerging technologies of the time, like the telegraph, the phonograph, and most notably the camera in order to do so, and people would go absolutely wild. And in, in, the, in terms of new media and digital technologies, there's a conception that people may engage less with their physical surroundings and that young people may turn away from legend tripping as a time passing activity because they have the internet. But I push back on this because if anything, the internet has only enabled more legend tripping to occur in embodied spaces by preserving legends that may have died out if solely reliant on in-person oral tradition. And there's been so much creativity and invention in legend creation online. Kinsella, who I just brought up now, has also written extensively about Ong's Hat. That, has anyone ever heard of this online legend game, open source game? Um, well, it's a collection of online stories written by four friends that was uploaded to The Well, that social networking site that started in the late 80s. And the story is nuts. It's basically like a multi-threaded, open-ended narrative that's an alternative history of parallel dimensions and chaos science, and it kind of sat as, as an online document uh, dormant for a long time before being discovered again by a wider community in the late 90s, and everyone added on to it, and it became a widespread, like, immersive legend trip that happened online. And uh, some really interesting elements made it a perfect legend tripping story, like um, the forms they were written in could be served as a magical tool, and there was all this stuff written about... Um, how you could basically like use your computer as a form of chaos magic. It's very neat. So uh, the digital space became the site of legend tripping itself, but it spilled over into embodied space as well, since Ong's Hat is an actual place. It's a ghost town in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, and people began visiting it, seeking out this portal to another dimension that they read about. And then uh, a more modern example, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Slender Man. It's been in, been in the news the past few years. Um, so on June 8th, 2009, a forum user on Something Awful created a challenge getting users to create paranormal images. And a couple days later, a user named Victor Serge, whose real name is Eric Knudsen, posted a couple black and white images. And uh, the first one on the left is uh, 
the first one he ever did on June 10th. And it was just this creepy image where if you could kind of see the tall, slender man in the background stalking these kids. And he included this caption, we didn't want to go, we didn't want to kill them, but his persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. Photograph from 1983, photographer unknown, presumed dead. And, uh, and then this uh, other photo, you can see kind of slender man with more like Lovecraftian tentacles in the background. Um, kind of a similar thing where he, he created this, um, this narrative behind it saying that this was a recovered photograph from a library fire. It was notable for being taken the day where 14 children vanished and this creature was there called the Slender Man and um, actual photograph confiscated as evidence. And history was made. Slender Man stories and photoshops made their way around the internet. It was all over DeviantArt, 4chan's Paranormal Board. And literally one week later, the Marble Hornets YouTube uh, channel was made and there's still like over 500,000 subscribers of these shaky cam, like found footage, Slender Man videos. And all of this came together to kind of create these different spaces as sites of legend tripping that replaced geographic place. And, um, and many have noticed that Slender Man's creation resembles open source software, that his persona and legend is similarly based on modification and reuse and sharing and transparency of infrastructure. And he's kind of a hybrid of more traditional folklore and open source peer production. Um, but that brings us to a complicated aspect of legend tripping online, because the platforms in which Slender Man created are not public, they're owned by corporations, and a capitalistic element has been lurking in the background of the story since its inception. And the creator of Slender Man, uh, Eric Knudsen, has since copyrighted the character, and a third party holds the media rights to Slender Man. There's a really bad looking movie that's coming out about him soon. And has chilled a lot of the engagement and fan creation that arguably created the mythos in the first place and turned this into a site of legend tripping. And on the darker side, I'm not going to be sharing any of the, the video from this. I'm just going to have this picture of Logan Paul crying in his apology. I'm sure you've heard about this in February. The YouTube star uh, Logan Paul and his friends visited and filmed a video in the Akigahara Forest, at the base of Mount Fuji, otherwise known as the Suicide Forest. And he went there because of the reputation. It's a, it's a pretty big legend tripping site. Usually people are more respectful and reverential when they go there. And uh, he went there because of the reputation it had, and when he came across someone who had actually taken their life, he capitalized off of it. And his video, The Discovery, went viral, and his disrespect and imperialist ignorance continued to do so after he removed it, because by then it already be had become part of the YouTube media landscape more broadly. So if you were a well-known YouTuber, you commented on his action, even to chastise him, and you got clicks. And meanwhile, the historical and cultural context of the forest itself and the efforts of suicide prevention in Japan and attempts to de-romanticize the physical place and attract less attention to it fell by the wayside. This dislocation of the space that he accomplished was not only offensive, it ruined what, if anything, could be referred to as a legend-tripping project of bringing people into communication with history and lost voices. So I'm not claiming what Logan Paul was, do was doing was in and of itself legend-tripping, but um, he took a twisted form of what it could look like when capital is injected into the practice to an extreme and gave it a global platform. So I just want to leave with... Um, this quote from a uh, Wendy He Kong Chun, who um, wrote a great piece on the enduring ephemeral in computers and technology, and she talks about the enduring ephemeral in digital media, and I think it's worth keeping with us while we're thinking about haunting in digital spaces and how it's not as different from our embodied experience of haunting as we might think and what a practice like legend tripping accomplishes. And she writes that information is dynamic, however, not only because it must move in space, but also, more importantly, because degeneration, not regeneration, makes memory possible while simultaneously threatening it. If our machine's memories are more permanent, if they enable a permanence that we seem to lack, it is because they're constantly refreshed so that their ephemerality endures. Thus, the scientific archive, rather than pointing us to the future, is trapping us in the past, making us repeat the present over and over again. And I think that sounds very familiar. So uh, thank you. Here's a creepy, creepy slender man. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> hello everybody, it's great to be here with you all. Um, my research is around self-denial and more specifically uh, how self-denial works on the internet. I mean, self-denial, it's a pretty self-explanatory thing. It's the refusal to give yourself the things that you want. So it applies to uh, giving things up and quitting, essentially. Um, what became apparent to me in my research was that it was um, pretty much impossible to quit the internet as such, you know, because it's so um, intertwined in lots of things that we do. It's here, um, it's not going to go away, and 
we love it. So, you know, uh, why should we quit it? So it became more interesting for me to think about the fact that it was so pervasive and what options we have to regulate, to perhaps regulate our use and um, employ um, like a, a mode of, of self-denial. Um, so we can um, delete our accounts, we can uninstall apps off our phones, um, we can set ourselves rules, I'm only going, on, going to go online for an hour in the evening, uh, we can use life management apps like this one, which is called Moment, which tracks your internet usage and then gives you a report, so you, so you can um, regulate it. It's got the, over on the right hand side there, you can see Phone Boot Camp, which te um, gives you a, a program to help you to uh, lessen your, your web usage, basically. Um, the more I looked into these different modes of self-regulation and self-denial, I started to realize that there's potentially a bit of a link um, between them and the rich and varied history of self-denial by men living in caves in the desert, monks and nuns in monasteries, and all that sort of thing. So um, I discovered that this deliberate practice of self-denial is called asceticism. And this got me to wondering what type of self-denial do we practice when we self-regulate on the internet? Are we still engaged in some sort of ascetic moment? So what we're going to do, we're going to have a quick look at the history of asceticism and then look at contemporary self-denial on the web through that historical lens. And this, the history of self-denial in the West obviously begins with Christianity. So I'm going to warn you now, we're going to go through some pretty unlikely territory over the next five minutes, but bear with me. Uh, it does have relevance later on. And also, I, say, I have no religious affiliation, so there's no agenda here. I love the fact that I have to say that on a, on a conference to do with the internet. Um, so, to begin, we've got, uh, we've got these guys, they're called Eremites, they're the first Christian ascetics. They lived in the Syrian and the Egyptian desert. Um, they were kind of like the rock stars of late antiquity. They quit their communities to live in isolation in places like caves, uh, on top of pillars. They spent their time doing things like denying themselves sleep and food, beating themselves and suffering the stings of scorpions and hornets. Um, the purpose of this type of self-denial was to draw power from being different. Their ability to curse, exercise, heal and perform miracles was gained through so uh, dogged self-determination and deprivation, twisting and emaciating their bodies into a physical form that disassociated itself from the everyday world. Uh, that's Simon of Stylites. Uh, Simon Stylites, who famously um, lived on the top of a pillar for 37 years in Syria. And that's a uh, kiss. <laughs> Not a fan, really. I just like the the fact they're both, they're all on kind of raised platforms. Um, by the Middle Ages, the Eremites had slowly evolved into another type of ascetic. Uh, these were called Cenobites. Uh, they lived together in friaries and monasteries and initially existed simply and communally. Um, this is because they took a more reductive approach in which their aim was to achieve transcendence through denying their own bodies and desires in favor of, of strict adherence to rules. So through silence and poverty and obedience, they sought to minimize their presence in the world. Whereas the Eremite attempted to pound himself into a visible image of perfection that was different from the quotidian reality, the Cenobite emptied the world out from the self. So God could essentially flow in. Um, they devoted themselves to prayer and work, finding salvation in all tasks, no matter how menial. And as a consequence, some of these monasteries became wealthy commercial centers. Um, this is a, a plan view of a monastery in Slovakia. And over there, um, there is an image of a bottle of Bukfast. Uh, a Bukfast is an alcoholic drink made by um, 
Benedictine monks in Devon in the UK, and it's most famous for making Scottish people crazy. Um, it's now made under license and raises revenue of over 40 million pounds annually. So these Benedictine monasteries, their devotion to work meant that uh, eventually they became wealthy commercial centers in themselves. And, and so the practice of self-denial took another turn with the Reformation in the 16th century. Um, what basically happened was a, a backlash against corruption and acquisitiveness in the church that really it resulted in outward acts of piety being useless for getting into heaven. So no matter how much you prayed, no matter how many images of you know, Jesus or whatever you had around your church, it didn't mean you had any better chance of getting into heaven. There was nothing you could do on earth to change your fate in the afterlife, which is kind of a scary thing for a for a population that spent a lot of time and energy on just that, trying to buy themselves into, uh, into heaven. And so what that resulted in was a, a type of a hidden inner self-denial, one that was not demonstrated by um, self-flagellation or strict routines of worship, but through work as a godly activity. People worked hard, and as a result, some accumulated profit but they couldn't spend that profit on luxuries because that would have been ungodly. So they reinvested it and that in turn generated more profit to do more good works for God on earth. Um, and this weird mix of self-interest and self-denial became synonymous with goodness and essentially helped fertilize the soil for the growth of capitalism. Um, so work, self-denial, the pursuit of profit and allowing the self-organizing cycles of the marketplace to take their course emerged as the morally correct way of structuring society. Uh, it's on this roller coaster that we're on. We arrive at the 20th, 20th century and the rise of uh, neoliberalism. So that kind of inner asceticism and the birth of capitalism continued to the point where um, some bright spark 20th century, um, come up with the idea that um, the self-generating or, um, order of the market was the best way to organise everything and to expand it beyond the field of work into every facet of life so that all are free to use their ingenuity to fashion the best way of life for themselves. This places every individual into an isolated position of perpetual rivalry, making us entrepreneurs of the self. So you're wondering what's this got to do with the internet, right? I'm going to get to that in a, bit in a sec. The presentation of choice and the opportunity for individual decision are key to this total free market approach. So a mechanism was required that could offer choice across the whole range of human activities in any region, across all ages and genders, which is pretty much a good description of the internet. So sure, now we, we all buy things, products are manufactured, um, but, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what the market now really does is produces communication that enables choice and stimulates decision. It's the immaterial it's the immaterial labor, to borrow a phrase from uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, that uh, the, the flow of information between nodes, people's sensors, laptops, phones, servers, databases, and so on, that really generates profit. For this to work, each node must be an outsider. It must be disassociated. Each individual, when they open their laptop, launch a browser, answer an email, or post to social media, is exercising a decision-making process that draws upon their uniqueness, their reservoir of difference, and feeds it into the network to be codified, analyzed, and monetized. What uses a database filled with identical fields or Outlook filled with identical emails? And then we've gone full circle. We are arriving back at the start to asceticism and the types of self-denial that we discussed earlier. The internet is, I have concluded, a massive self-denying mechanism in which all users are at once eremites and cenobites. So much so that regular acts of opting out, like leaving Facebook or using Moment, are useless in the face of a larger, more insidious 
instrumentalization of self-denial itself. So how are we Eremites in the 21st century? Um, here we see Irene of Thessaloniki. She was martyred for refusing to eat at a feast and a slice of pizza, the most Instagrammed food with over 17 million, million pizza tags back in 2015, spurious fact there. In one, we see an eremitic figure whose agency emerged from a refusal to engage in the communal activity of eating. In the other, we see how agency is mined by Instagram by reducing it to an individual transaction that also denies this communal activity of eating. Both involve isolation as an act of self-constitution in which uniqueness is a resource and commonality is denied. Whereas the Aramites of later antiquity cultivated their uniqueness to imbue their words and gestures with significant agency in the world, I'm cultivating my uniqueness to imbue my words and gestures with significant value in the market. But if Eremites are unique and Cenobites are uniformly the same, how can we be both at once? The answer lies in the way in which this uniqueness is achieved. Which is through an adherence to a particular organisational logic, one that offers choice and decision, but within a framework that effectively nullifies them. If we think of the rules that monks followed unquestioningly in order to negate themselves, and we think of the protocols, both behavioural and technical, that underpin the internet, we can see that again, there is a process of self-denial that comes from the channeling of behaviour into such confined parameters. Um, got 30 seconds left, so I'm going to skip a bit. It's pretty bleak, really. <laughs> But to conclude, right, uh, and I might run over a tiny bit, so just don't stop me, I'll keep going. Um, what is interesting is that in this heart, in the arc of historical self-denial, is that there are, are hints of useful ideas that have been genuinely uh, emancipatory and revolutionary. Um, I was meant to have a slide of a picture of Saint, with a picture of St. Francis on it, but it's not here, I must have deleted it. Um, but he's usually photographed, surrounded by, uh, photographed, he's usually uh, depicted, it's sort of 14th century, um, he's normally depicted surrounded by animals, um, and Franciscan monks and their female counterparts, the poor clares, um, as well as taking the usual vows of chastity and obedience, they also took like a radical vow of poverty, whereby they became incapable of owning things, like uh, animals and children. Um, they cleverly, they could share things, but they couldn't own them. They cleverly manipulated the technologies of the organized church to, ex to allow them to exist within it, but without lapsing into its kind of dominating trend for isolated self-interest that then set the scene for capitalism. Their social vulnerability emphasized the bonds of reliance that tied these men and women together. And I see exciting glimmers of this mode of consensual self-regulation in the federated um, communalisms of platforms like Mastodon, uh, community mesh networks, and things that I'm interested in as an artist, like uh, local wireless area networks. These things have got great possibility for scalability when it is required, um, but it's not a necessity. So rather than constant and expansion and depletion, um, what you end up with, if you use those consensual federated communal platforms is one of um, conservation and sustainability. So that's it. Thank you. Um, just to kind of in a prefatory way um, to address the panel themes and get that out of the way. Um, fantasy, because manifestos are wishful thinking. Faith, uh, because they're faith over reason. And fiction, because, um, have you read the Communist Manifesto? It starts with a ghost story, right? Spectre is haunting Europe. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about something else. <laughs> um, all right, um, Twitter. Uh, did anyone watch the Grammys? 
Uh, I didn't watch the Grammys because I, I live in Portugal and it's on at 4 a.m. and with Portuguese commentary overdubbed. Um, but um, I, but I saw the tweet. Um, so I saw that this I saw that Lord was wearing this uh, one of Jenny Holster's inflammatory essays, um, kind of stitched onto her blood red dress, uh, and it was inspiring. I love this inflammatory essay. Rejoice! Our times are intolerable. Take courage for the worst is, the, you know, uh, it's an inspiring kind of rant. Um, and I would say the same for the other Holzer manifestos and, and, and her truisms, her slogans that are seen everywhere nowadays, especially in New York, um, in sync with the new militant activism of our intolerable times. Um, for example, uh, abuse of power comes as no surprise, um, which uh, inspired its own Not Surprised Manifesto and Me Too movement in the art world. Um, I noticed, however, that some of the more unsettling, less inspiring inflammatory essays are reproduced and retweeted um, less often. So uh, you might see this one. Um, this one's pretty, pretty common. Uh, it has the shocking violence. Um, I'll cut the smile off your face. Um, but it's sort of got a seemingly straightforward message, though in fact it's, it's highly ambiguous. Um, but on the other hand, you don't see um, this one very often. This, the most exquisite pleasure is domination. Nothing can compare with the feeling, uh, and so on. And even less, uh, I definitely haven't seen guns on a t-shirt, at least not in New York. Um, you get amazing sensations from guns. You get results from guns. Uh, and so on. So then you start to see that, of course, uh, the inflammatory essays aren't manifestos, they're manifesto art or art from manifestos. Um, but some of them can be repurposed as manifestos in, kind of by being put in a new context. Um, Holzer summed up the ambivalence of her inflammatory essays in an interview in 1989. Uh, she said, um, I tried to figure out what kind of form would be uneasy and hot. I love that, uneasy and hot. Um, and I went to the manifesto. Uh, I wanted to include both sides of manifesto making, one being the scary side, where it's an inflamed rant to no good end, and then the positive side, when it's the most deeply felt description of how the world should be, uh, which is a great description of the two things that a manifesto can be, I think. Um, so even stripped of their particular, their particular contexts, these texts uh, retain their power as manifestos because they retain the passion and mad dedication. Manifestos have to mean it, uh, but this is also what gets them into trouble when they mean it so much that frustrated by the limits of um, polite language, they reach beyond measured words um, to make the, their target feel their point and to kind of make it hurt um, for the person they're aiming at or the, whatever they're aiming at. Um, in Cory Doctorow's first novel, Down and Out, in the Magic Kingdom, um, death is, as I remember, death has been cured so you can kill someone just to make a point as a kind of rhetorical flourish. Um, this seems like a suitable analogy, if somewhat offhand, uh, for manifestos and their fantasy of stepping beyond the limitations of language. Manifestos can be full of hope, um, they can be bright futures, noble principles, uh, but violence is baked into their DNA. In the 1960s, of course, were full of manifestos for armed, armed liberation struggles. Uh, the Black Panthers will be fairly familiar. The um, FLQ manifesto from Quebec, maybe less so if you're not Canadian like me, um, but um, it's an interesting uh, image. The essential dichotomy in all revolutionary manifestos lies between the desire to um, resist or transgress authority and to impose authority. Uh, as someone said recently, the relationship with authority is always a little bit kinky. Um, so my question is, is the manifesto a genre beyond redemption, as some have claimed, for its history of violence and misogyny, or does it still hold promise for artists and activists? Manifestos are often used to circumvent formal processes uh, and channels of governance, not unlike social media. Um, and I see the manifesto as providing both a model uh, as a public direct critical voice and a warning prone to all the traps of fake news, propaganda, dumbing down, false claims on authority, uh, and so on. On balance, I think it does more harm than good. Uh, sorry, more good than harm. It's an open question. Um, but in, on the more good side, uh, it helps you put into words what you as an individual or collective believe, and um, it helps provoke discussion and, and outline 
uh, concrete actions leading to change. But again, it's up for debate, as you'll see. Um, so the manifesto now, uh, in 2018, uh, is, uh, as it was a century ago, one of the most exciting written forms, from accelerationism to post-capitalism, Antifa to Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Not Surprise, Never Again. Um, movements and collectives are using manifestos to proclaim themselves to the world. Today, manifestos exist in a transnational space, liberated um, often from the confines of the state, but still engaged with situated, situated issues and concerns. Uh, but I remember when they weren't cool. Um, so the turning point was kind of 2008, a year that, that's been coming up a lot um, in the last two days, I think. Um, the rise of social media, obviously. Uh, the financial crisis also, quite obviously. And over the next um, few years with Occupy and grass grassroots political movements um, responding to the crisis in Europe, I think I was standing behind the photographer in the bottom um, picture because I remember that very well. Um, but that's uh, in the kind of dark times of the financial crisis in Europe. Um, uh, obviously, recent elections. Um, radical and, po and populist politics have returned uh, to center stage and never more so than today, 50 years on from um, the turbulent spring of 1968. Uh, going a bit further back though, it's thanks to the futurists. Um, the last panel was on, well, there were a couple of um, uh, digs into um, selfies, and this is a great example if you want to take note. Um, Depero's uh, self-portrait as a kind of asshole, I think. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's a definitely a striking selfie. Um, so the futurists, uh, represented by the Stepero selfie, and to a lesser extent the vorticists um, in London, um, the manifesto has long been associated with misogynistic violence. Uh, Marinetti wrote in 1908 of his desire to introduce the fist into the artistic struggle, he told his followers that violence was an essential ingredient of every manifesto. He famously called war the world's only hygiene, promoted militarism and contempt for women. Um, the other Im image is um, a sort of patronizing statement from the Vorticist uh, magazine Blast. Um, ironically, it's condemning um, suffragettes for their um, direct action, um, uh, in this case, uh, painting slashing. Um, Benjamin famously wrote about the way futurism and fascism uh, aestheticize violence. So there's my aestheticizing violence slide. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, I think that's Hamburg, is it? G20, a few years ago. Um, art and activism, of course, don't have to be comfortable, but you have to ask what purpose the violence serves. Uh, on a more serious note, uh, um, as the Norwegian mass murderer Anders Breivik demonstrated in 2083, uh, a European Declaration of Independence, a rambling 1,500-page collage of racist and misogynistic propaganda, the web provides endless content for manifestos. One of the numerous sources copied into um, the diatribe, along with passages from Orwell and Thomas Jefferson, uh, was Ted Kaczynski's Industrial Society and Its Future, um, the 35,000-word uh, Unabomber, man uh, Unabomber Manifesto. Um, and uh, disseminating the manifesto was Kaczynski's um, big and final demand. Um, and similarly, Breivik's um, manifesto begins with this mad, meticulous um, pages of instructions for translating and spreading uh, the manifesto across the internet via um, social media. He shouts out to his 7,000 Facebook followers um, and, and torrent sites. Um, then there's the example, uh, also rem reminiscent of Kaczynski, of last year's firebombing of the Casemate Fab Lab um, in France by an anarchist group there, which is an example of um, anti-techno-capitalist anti or neo-Luddite action. Uh, their manifesto, what I thought was interesting was they declared that um, it was, quote, an inseparable echo of our incendiary act. So they're really clearly putting the manifesto together with the act um, against an institution uh, against this institution, which is notoriously harmful for its diffusion of digital culture. Um, violent manifesto rhetoric uh, isn't limited to fascists and misogynists. Um, the poet Valentin de saint pons manifesto of futurist woman, which is a response to Marinetti and his contempt for women, uh, declares, quote, 
let women find once more uh, let women find once more her cruelty and her violence. Um, Valerie Solanus is a direct descendant. Uh, the first line of her scum manifesto is, has perhaps the best opening line of any manifesto, in my opinion, um, exemplifying what is most thrilling and most disturbing about the genre. And I won't read it, but you should um, read the whole thing. It's pretty amazing. Um, so manifestos give a powerful voice to those who feel powerless uh, or frustrated or aggrieved um, for whatever reason, uh, and this includes, uh, you know, this is justified or not. So it might be um, Jesse Crispin saying, my feminism is a cleansing fire, uh, or I do pose a threat, or it could be Sarah Ahmed in her recent Killjoy manifesto who writes, uh, you have to let the violence spill all over the pages. But this powerful voice might also be used by uh, a Dylan Roof or an Elliot Roger, who's now sadly back in the headlines after Toronto, um, and who in the midst of his killing spree um, stopped to post a video uh, statement on YouTube and send out his 100,000 word um, incel manifesto. Um, there's definitely something about the length of a manifesto uh, connected to, probably back to Hitler, um, connecting to its um, Toxicity. Meanwhile, um, shifting to the more comfortable ground of art, the 3D additivist manifesto by Morshin Aliyari and Daniel Rourke clar um, clarifies where the art manifesto is now and sheds light on uses of um, violence um, as a positive. The main job of art, uh, Rourke told me uh, in an email, is not to aesthetically please, but to disturb and disrupt ideas and principles. On the topic of mass shootings, he said, we can all agree that the recent spate of young white males committing mass shootings is horrific. Their manifestos are driven by singular ideals and their provocative quality, qualities are crude, simplistic, and entirely devoid of self-reflection. In contrast, he said, Solanus or, Mar or Marinetti show uh, a subtlety and dark humor that raises them above idealism and into a critical artistic realm. Um, added additivism draws inspiration, uh, according to Aliyari, from ca classic templates like futurism. But along with these continuities, there's also radical new content and new means of circulation. The, uh, their manifesto is a computer animated uh, web based video. Um, the, the movement relies on social media and calls not for paintings and poetry, but glitches and algorithms. Uh, Valerie Salinas faced reporters outside the 13th precinct. Uh, on June 3rd, 1968, almost exactly 50 years ago, after she'd shot Warhol, and she said, read my manifesto and it will tell you what I am. Manifestos are always, often literally, at the bleeding edge of culture and society. In the current decade, the manifesto has once again found its moment, not only in art, um, but in society and politics. In Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider's book, um, Ours to Hack and Own, um, they argue that the source of platform capitalism's power is the uh, culture built up by its corporations. Quote, the festivals, the meetups, the memes, the manifestos. To change these norms, they argue, requires writing new manifestos. Um, manifestos help us to conceive the future, to pry open new discursive and imaginative spaces, to force new ideas like platform cooperativism into public view. The return of the manifesto um, short, visual, often violent, uh, emotional, and immune to facts is certainly double-edged. Manifestos hold great potential for positive change, but also reflect the dangers that come with extremism and a fragmented populace. The return of a form that was so ubiquitous in pe periods of crisis during the last century is in one sense symptomatic of our present um, upheaval. But I prefer to think of the manifesto as a potential cure, and I'll just wrap up here, uh, a tool for activists in challenging and uncertain times. Um, this, I'll leave you with this image of something I've been tinkering with with colleagues in Portugal called a manifesto machine. We can't figure out whether it's like um, a joke or serious uh, as a tool, but we're playing around with it with students um, right now. So thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Darcy. I'm going to talk a little bit about mysticism on the internet. Um, thanks so much for having me, theorizing the web. 
Um, I think in the program, my talk is called Popular Mysticism on the Internet, and I just added a little correction to my first slide here. It's actually unpopular mysticism that I'm most interested uh, in talking about. Um, to give you a little background about myself, I'm a writer, I, a content producer who works in tech, um, and besides that, I'm in Jungian psychoanalysis, and I practice the Meisner technique with a group of actors. So I'm interested in these outmoded practices and techniques, um, and that's why I'm talking about this today, popular mysticism and the internet. Um, by popular mysticism, I'm referring to the resurgence of practices like astrology, uh, cartomancy, more popularly tarot cards, um, crystal healing, Reiki, sound baths, and uh, all of this stuff that was very popular in the 60s and 70s and, and harkens back to the Middle Ages and um, is now uh, back again. So um, let me see here. This is a a my birth chart a star chart um a friend of mine gifted me a skype session with an astrologer for my birthday last year and based on the information that i gave her um generated this on a website called www.astro.com um so from the perspective of someone who who works for tech companies um horoscopes are great. Like every tech company I've ever worked at is like, let's do horoscopes, <laughs> even if it almost has no connection to, uh, the, the project. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're at best a daily habit at worst, a, a monthly habit, and you might even check them daily, weekly and monthly. Um, it gets you to give your birthday up, which is very important. So they know what kind of ads to target to you and who's using their product. Um, and I mean, there's been a lot of writing about this, so I won't talk about it too much, but um, a lot of people speculate that horoscopes are are more popular in quote unquote dark times so that during the Trump administration, a lot of people are turning to, to horoscopes. Um, also on the rise is cartomancy um, or tarot cards. I'm using that kind of like more obscure term because this, I wanted to show this picture from Jenna Wortham, um, who is the tech reporter at the New York Times. Um, and she's using like a different, it's not a tarot deck, it's like a French cartomancy deck. Um, so she's like very into this kind of stuff and she's a little more advanced. Um, but there's like the commercial artist Adam JK recently posted on Instagram stories, a poll asking, should I really make that tarot deck that he had sketched um, to the effect of like getting a ton of likes um, previously. Um, there's other influencers like Small Spells who um, brand themselves as astrologers, um, tarot card, they give tarot card lessons, they are spiritual advisors, um, and she specifically has a deck of tarot cards. Um, so I'll, go, <laughs> I'll stay here for one second. Um, I mean, these things like uh, tarot readings and horoscopes elicit this it me feeling that's often talked about um, gives people a real insight into their their own identity um, a feeling of security of what may happen in the future um, both of these practices have forward-looking elements to them and their systems of symbols um, which makes it easy they have a sort of visual language um, so they're Instagram friendly um, so the moment we're in now, coming off of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, there's a, this kind of staged public discourse and outrage about the amount of data that companies are collecting on us. Um, it actually seems that despite all of this outrage, people are very easy to give up their information online. Um, especially in the case that it might be reflected back to them in the form of like a personality quiz, which was a, a big tool Cambridge Analytica used. Um, so, you know, if the end result is some self-reflection, um, people will give up their data. Um, the problem with, the problem occurs when what's happening with the data is happening unbeknownst to them or sort of against their will. Um, so this is why for tech companies, horoscopes and tarot cards are very in, like they're, they're totally okay with them um, because they present sort of alternative user profiles that um, 
obscure away from the actual user profiles that they have created for all of us using the product that we can't see because they're somewhere on the back end. Um, and they're also based on other worlds that are sort of alternatives to our digital world. Um, another tool for deflection. Um, so here is a picture of Eva Chen. She's an influencer and she works at Instagram. She does fashion partnerships there. Um, and this is an example of like crystals and she's aligning her chakras with the help of some crystals here. Um, other products that are sort of IRL products that offer this antidote or panacea to um, the digital world are like sound baths and, and Reiki um, that are very popular now. Um, so these are very, like tactile practices and they're, they're often very profitable when they're commercialized and not happening um, within communities. Um, and they're really a way to increase and sustain internet usage by being able to go offline, be healed and rejuvenated, and then you go back online and you're sold more crystals. Um, another popular form of mysticism that we see is witchcraft. Um, I just for kicks applied to the wing and they call their applicants witches. Like the URL is like witches.thewing.com or something as you're applying. Um, this is Lana Del Rey who like cast a spell on Trump um, along with a bunch of other witches. Um, these, I mean, you can just see like the, the public is pretty comfortable with this mode of talking about things and, and I'll argue that, you know, tech companies sort of make room for this because it allows their users to have a form of agency and because um, big tech, if you will, doesn't really give any credence to this, they're like, okay, let them, you know, sort of have their spells and that's, that's fine with us. So um, I do want to talk about some forms of mysticism that haven't taken hold on the internet, um, specifically psychic prediction and synchronicity. Um, so like straightforward psychic prediction in the form of palm reading or crystal ball um, has really gone the way of like numerology in that it never has cropped up again. It hasn't come back into fashion. Um, the tech world is very protective of their status as a, a harbinger of a techno-utopian future. So I think any legitimate psychic would threaten one whatever. It, it might contradict Elon Musk's future that he's creating for us, for example. Um, he's very invested in, in having all of us believe that we will go to Mars and we, we will be driving electric cars. And, and so if we believe that, coming from him will buy his products. Um, if a psychic is says, well, we're not going to live on Mars, then that's not good for Elon Musk. Um, it also threatens technology, this sort of pure psychic uh, force, by revealing that in tech there is a mystical discourse that isn't completely scientific and objective. Um, so let's move on to synchronicity. Um, Synchronicity, this chart, I don't know if it explains anything to you, but um, <laughs> uh, it's a term coined by Carl Jung to express meaningful coincidence. So specifically the occurrence of two or more events with an a-causal relationship, um, they're sort of undeniably connected. Um, so you might be thinking about something or discussing something and simultaneously a physical manifestation appears. Um, one example that's used is like you've ordered a blue dress and it comes um, in your like Amazon package. Um, this is like an, an old school example, but I'll update it. So it comes on Amazon and you, you open it and they've accidentally sent you a black dress and moments later you get a call that your grandmother has died. And and in that way, it's like it, these two things don't cause each other. There's the relationship between them. You're just sort of asked to find um, a, a common meaning. So for Jung, um, he sort of created a world, uh, a worldview to explain how how this might be possible. And um, he proposed that there's a fourth dimension to the triad of classical physics. So space, time, causality, and synchronicity. He argued. Um, 
And that's sort of his preferred number is the number four. He sees that as the most balanced, perfect unit as opposed to the Christian trinity, which physics um, also seems to prefer with their three-pronged um, triad. And the idea is um, contingent also on this uh, a term he uses as unis mundus, um, which is a Latin term that can be traced back to the Middle Ages, but it's a it's a unified theory of matter, so internal and external. There's so, some sort of absolute truth that's governing all things, and they're all coming from the same source. Um, and he worked on this with Wolfgang Pauli, the Swiss-American theoretical physicist and pioneer of quantum physics. Um, and for Jung, archetypes are an expression of unis mundus, and often um, synchronistic events manifest themselves in this kind of archetypal symbolism. Um, and it's all possible because things are all stemming from the same source. Um, so the first problem with acknowledging synchronicity in a, in a digital landscape is that it's very hard to differentiate from the algorithm. So targeted content and synchronistic content uh, end up looking very similar. Um, Almost always the algorithm that we use sort of loosely to talk about how companies target data or target content to us um, is not transparent, so we don't really know the inner workings of it. Um, and it's kind of based on this, this user profile that we also don't know um, what, what they've collected. Um, so... I'm just kind of skipping ahead. Um, this is the, the series of Instagrams that first drew me to the topic. Um, first, I saw this one, everything is a dildo if you're brave enough. And I scrolled down, and directly after it was this post. Um, with I, It has no caption, actually. It's just um, <laughs> a slideshow of phallic looking vegetables at the grocery store. So I was like could this be targeted content? Is there a way in which like Facebook via Instagram um, might be showing me this because they somehow identified what was in the photos and I, I don't know. So I, I looked into it and I, I found out a little bit about Facebook's use of computer vision. Um, they had a company or they have a platform called Lumos, which was initially used to improve the experience of visually impaired using the platform so it could describe what was happening in the photos. And apparently it's being um, uh, used now for searches, so you can search for what kind of content you want to see, and it'll d show you pictures of people running in the mountains or whatever you might search for. Um, but this works horribly. I, I can't imagine that it's really working. If you've ever tried to search for anything on Instagram, it's like very hard to do. Um, so that just gives a little bit more credence to the fact that these might be synchronistic events happening online. Um, I just have a few, like this was one one night. There Maybe just, it was just that beats were in season, but there were all of these <laughs> posts about beats that sort of were coming up like more and more rapidly as I engaged with them. Um, obviously, the the basis of synchronicity is that you have to, it's, it's a meaningful coincidence. It can't, the, it's not just a coincidence. Um, so some of these had meaning at the time, others less so. Um, and really the only way we're going to be able to differentiate between synchronistic content and content that's targeted to us um, is if we know a little bit more about how these algorithms are targeting content to us. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to see tech companies really coming over to to the synchronistic side of things, because um, it would mean for them giving up a bit of agency. Um, for them to be incorporated into unis mundus and be expressions of messages that um, aren't that they're not the the arbiters of um, that would take a lot. So I'm I'm not optimistic about it, but I, I do feel like um, there are, there are ways in which if we believe that this synchronicity is a force at work, that technology is inevitably wrapped up in it. Um, 
And the only downside of that is that we might just be getting more messages about messages that we're about to see. So I, um, like yesterday, asked the Alexa what time it was. And instead of, I, I don't, she must have heard me wrong. Um, she started playing light pop hits from the 70s. And um, ABBA came on. And moments later, I saw on Twitter that ABBA is reuniting and releasing a new single. Um, and so I was like... You know, I'm, I'm not sure how meaningful that is, but when these devices start talking to each other and that's sort of the, the terms for what, what is meaningful, you get synchronistic events that just sort of speak in this, this digital loop. So that's the end of my talk. Thanks. Thank you for that. That was great. So we've got about seven minutes here for questions. Um, since we went a little bit long, I want to just, if anyone has a question in the audience, um, feel free to raise your hand. Yeah, please. I love the talk on the digital synchronicities. Um, it's something I've been watching for about five years. Uh, with my friends, with the news, everybody's finding just massive amounts of news. And to your point, the more these devices talk to each other, the more rich raw material we can draw these out. Just from a human aspect, what, what do you think has happened? I love the way you're so easily safe. I because I'm in Jungian psychoanalysis, I, I have like a room where it's totally fine to be like, yes, synchronicity exists. I don't think everyone feels as strongly about that. Um, I I totally believe that meaningful messages come sort of um, when they're necessitated in, in life and uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm a true believer. <laughs> just, you know, I've worked for tech companies that have actually engineered this kind of algorithmic synchronicity, so it's, they do do it. Let's talk more after, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, do you not think that maybe if you become aware that all of these things are, are speaking to each other, that it might kind of kill that mystic potential completely. So you, you, the idea that there might be some sort of synchronicity at work, could you, if you were cynical like me, it could just be like, well, it's just, it's just things talking to each other and there's no kind of synchronicity there whatsoever. And that kind of, that idea of synchronicity just kind of fades away. Is that, is that a possibility maybe? Well, I think I think what I'm interested in is is sort of identifying moments where it doesn't seem like the algorithm could could have worked to do this at all. So I I mean I didn't talk about it much in in my talk, but and I mean in computer vision is one way specifically with visual images that that's um, going to become even harder and harder to identify. Um, but but there are moments that seem sort of inexplicable, and I, I think that those will persist and be maybe some kind of saving grace for us. <laughs> I, was watching, I was watching TV yesterday morning, and there was a, a segment on one of the nasty panel news shows early in the morning talking about whether your phone is actually listening to what you're saying. You know, people say they have a talk, they're talking about a particular type of moisturizer, and then they turn their phone on, and all of a sudden, you know, they're getting ads for that type of moisturizer. And they were saying on this panel show that that's tech, tech companies deny that, that that happens. You know, it's, it's not that the microphone is not listening to what you're, what you're saying. So in that case, maybe it is still, it's this type of synchronicity that you're talking about that can st still exist. But it's that idea that there's a bit of uncertainty around it. Mind you, I suppose there's always been uncertainty around it anyway, right? I don't want to be willfully naive. Like I think that tech companies could say no, that that's not happening, and it's definitely happening. Like there's no way that like they, it just happened that a Vino moisturizer is now being is now in my ads. Like I just that happened to my wife, and it was with a Vino moisturizer. Yeah, <laughs> it happens to me. <laughs> so maybe it's just a Vino. <laughs> okay. Um. Um, so I have one thing. Some of it's just statistics, right? A billion users a day. Some even 0.001 percent chance happening. Hundreds of thousands of people there really having these experiences. Like that. To what extent do you feel like that's playing in the fact that these services are at such a scale 
that might mean is to spread too close. I mean, in the sense that that these coincidences are meaningful, I think it's it's hard. It's a little bit hard to define, right? Because it has to feel meaningful to the person experiencing it. Like, obviously, coincidence happens all the time. Um, and I mean, I I think that's that's the difference between being a, a cynic and a believer is thinking, oh well, you know, this happens a million times every day. And and if you believe that the world is dictated by this kind of uh, you know, you're being fed um, like it glimpses into some sort of absolute truth that if you just you opened your eyes and, and saw that, that's sort of the basis of synchronicity, right? It's like, oh, if you just pay attention to these coincidences and see that they're meaningful, you might tune in to something um, that's more some kind of like universal truth. Um, if, if you don't believe that, I think you're gonna, going to feel like there's a million uh, just random kind of coincidental things happening. Okay, we got time for one more if anyone else has one. Um, but let, there's someone in the back here. Let's. Um, thank you. Uh, for Dave, I just had a um, question as to whether you had thought about incorporating non Western aesthetic practices into this research. Um, how might, for instance, Jane or Hindu practices look? in the context of uh, digital aesthetics? That's a, a really good question. And I have considered that. And the thing about, the thing that makes the kind of Christian asceticism particularly relevant is the degree to which it f tried to formalize behavior, yeah? So what it, it provided Christians across medieval Europe with was a set of rules that dictated their behavior, yeah? And down to the, the, the most minute detail. Um, and I saw a, a weird correlation between that and say Facebook, you know, something that's trying to um, implicate itself in lots of aspects of our lives. So you, ha you have a very formal system and then you have groups of people who try to um, find ways to operate within those very formal systems. So that's where my interest, I mean, uh, Giorgio Agamben write, uh, wrote a really a good book called The Highest Poverty, which is all about um, monastic asceticism. And that spoke to me. I am very aware that um, there are lots of other types of asceticism out there. You know. Um, Buddhism and all of these um, other um, systems. It's just that the Christianity side of things kind of speaks to the really controlling um, analogy between kind of religion and um, the, the internet. Great. Um, on that note, we are out of time. I want to thank all of you for coming and listening and being such a gracious audience. I want to thank our panelists, um, Stephanie, Dave, Julian and Ashley, it was amazing. I learned a lot. Um, if you wanna come chat afterwards, we'll be here for a few more minutes. The next panel starts at three. Um, there's been a little bit of a misprint in the, uh, the schedules if you have them. The meal period is at 4.15. You might see it's it was printed underneath the end of this session, but it's actually at four. So we have three to 4.15 will be one more round of panels and then you can eat. And then we'll have keynotes at six. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.